HVAC and heat transfer coefficients. This video is another exploration from strategies for deploying virtual representations of the built environment. Practitioners evolve working practices that balance resources available and tool skills. If the tool falls over or shouts at us, we take a closer look. Otherwise, we carry on. The trouble is that simulation tools often rely on user directives for ratcheting up the resolution of a model or invoking non-standard methods. In this video, we look at often missed options related to heat transfer between the air and surfaces. It's a rather geeky topic, isn't it? Well, ESBR includes dozens of correlations drawn from the literature. However, it is not required that users express an opinion so most assessments end up being based on the default method, based on the work of Alamdari and Hammond. According to Ian Bosley Morrison's thesis, our choices about heat transfer can have significant impacts across a range of performance metrics. For example, A and H is applicable if the temperature difference between the surface and the air is because of conduction through the facade, or a sun patch, or some embedded heating or cooling device. In those cases, it has a well-founded method for de deriving heat transfer with the adjacent air. Not so if we introduce radiators or air-based environmental controls. His thesis, well, it makes a bracing read. Let's go and explore this. For purposes of this video, let's take an extreme air movement case to demonstrate how predictions can diverge from observations. For decades, researchers have devised physical tests of buildings to capture their performance characteristics. One class of test is called coheating. It involves tracking how much energy is required to maintain a building at a specific temperature over several weeks. A variant of coheating, developed by the University of Strathclyde and the Building Research Establishment, subjects an actual building to a sequence of tests over a week, as well as requiring the creation of a virtual twin of the experiment. First, the building drifts to its natural unconditioned state, and then a step change of roughly 20 degrees is imposed by way of heating with fan-induced air movement for roughly eight hours, followed by a maintained set point phase of roughly 24 hours to 36 hours, and lastly a cool down period of several days with the fans off. These observations can then be used to calibrate the virtual experiment. It also happens to be a good test of how well the simulation tool can replicate the conditions of such an experiment. If you're curious about this test, look at the following link to see a presentation about how that works. When we run the experiment, we get a different story. The air temperature rises very quickly. Looking at the lounge during the warm-up phase of the test, the surface temperatures clearly lag that of the room air temperature, and there is considerable difference between the MRT and the air temperature. It fails to capture the inertia observed in the experiment. The corrective action was to impose heat transfer rates based on the observed air velocity when the fans were operating. So in an extreme case, getting the heat transfer regime aligned with conditions in the room is critical to improving the predictions of the digital tin. What about environmental controls that rely on air as a delivery mechanism? In an earlier constant air volume versus variable air volume video, see the link, we saw that the delivery of heated and chilled air to the rooms resulted in rapid ratcheting of temperatures. Again, temperature inertia, one might expect, was missing. Of course, there are lots of simulation tools that default to Alamdari and Hammond. It's been there for a very long time. And the scary thing is, many early stage models and any number of ESPR exemplar models Use idealized controls with pure convective actuators. That's a proxy for HVAC. I suspect if we took a close look, they might also exhibit the same kind of ratcheting of temperatures 
in the same lack of inertia we've just seen. Whether or not we use an abstract control law to represent HVAC or a component-based approach, a review of heat transfer assumptions might be a really good thing. One of the research topics undertaken by Beausoleil Morrison is a mixed mode heat transfer regime for cases of room which include wall or ceiling grills associated with HVAC. Let's look at a typical attribution session for heat transfer coefficients. We'll take a simple case where all days are treated the same and then we are going to pick from the list of different mixed flow options. Let's choose the variable air volume one. There is information available about that you might want to read, but best to go and look in the thesis. Essentially, we're taking information described elsewhere in the model and reiterating it for the uh, heat transfer coefficient method to use. We've got an air handler delivering temperatures within a certain range and within a certain air change rate, and we're putting that information in so that it can assess conditions. We then save that information into a zone file. If we look at the actual details, um, each surface has an orientation and some attributes related to the heat transfer that's going to be assessed when we run simulations. So what does those heat transfer coefficient files look like? Well, let's compare two files for different underlying assumptions of flow, constant volume versus VAV, and essentially you get different uh, detailed correlation and attributes inside the file. There is not a great deal of documentation within the file itself as to what those codes mean. What are the performance implications of adding user directives for heat transfer coefficients? Looking at the constant air volume control, on the left we have the original model, on the right we have the model after the addition of heat transfer correlations added. We can see the ratcheting is much less. If we pay attention to the MRT line, on the left we see it slowly begins to rise from about 7 in the morning, reaching a peak a little bit after 12 o'clock. With the heat transfer coefficients, it's rather warmer early in the morning, and then its rise is much quicker, reaching uh, stable conditions about 9 o'clock in the morning, which results in a longer period of time during the middle of the day when we're simply maintaining conditions within the room. And there's a few brief intro introductions of heat into the space. Let's turn our attention to VAV flows in the offices. On the right, we have the default initial model. On the left, we have the model with the addition of heat transfer regime. The ratcheting is definitely, again, different. It takes much longer for the mean radiant temperature in the space in the original case. That's actually maybe two o'clock in the afternoon before we reach a stable condition, whereas the stable conditions happens around 10 o'clock in the morning. If we compare constant air volume on the left with variable air volume, both of which have heat transfer coefficient regimes applied, we see the stable conditions in the middle of the day are approximately the same length of time from about nine o'clock till six o'clock. The CAV does have a brief period getting close to 24 degrees to pull it up to temperature, while as the VAV, the room temperature only very briefly gets to 22 degrees. 
If we turn our attention to flow rates from the air handler to each of the offices, we see that the constant air volume flows with the default heat transfer coefficients on the left are ratcheting until about one o'clock in the afternoon, whereas it's, they only ratchet till about 10 o'clock in the morning with the heat transfer coefficients. Changing to the VAV controls, on the left the default is just working much harder for a much longer time than with heat transfer coefficients in place. What's happening in the air handler itself? Remember that's modeled as a separate zone with a control law inside. On the left we have a constant air volume, on the right VAV. The temperature within the air handler in the CAV is a little bit warmer than in the VAV. The total sensible gain being added to the air handler though is relatively less in the CAV case than it is in the VAV. The addition of heat transfer regimes, we can see that the temperatures as well as the heat injection have varied somewhat from the default case. Here is a table summarizing some of the energy implications of including mixed heat transfer coefficients in models with CAV or VAV. Adding mixed heat transfer correlations increase the apparent inertia of the models. A lot of the ratcheting of temperatures has been dampened down Probably these patterns are a better fit to observations. The review of existing models might show that some of them would also be improved by considered use of heat transfer directives.